I'm Dr. Lee Whittinghill, Assistant Professor of Urban Agriculture at Kentucky State University. I'm going to be talking today about green roofs, historical and modern, and the many benefits that um, using green roofs can provide. Green roofs have many names. In some places, they're called vegetative roofs or eco roofs, living roofs or rooftop gardens. Sometimes which name is used will depend on how the green roof was created. So our green roof with container gardens might be considered a rooftop garden, uh, but this one here might not. Green roofs, at least modern green roofs, are a technology made up of layers. Layers that are designed to allow water to drain, but also provide support and nutrition for plants. The bottom layer is the drainage layer. This is the one that allows any excess water to run off the roof, prevent pooling, and weight problems. That often has a filter fabric above it, as you can see here. That helps to prevent small particles from clogging the drainage layer. It may also include a water retention fabric to help hold more water, and then growing medium. On top of the growing medium are the plants. Green roof media, or growing medium, depending on how you want to say it, is made up of about 50% heat expanded slate or shale. Sometimes it also includes terracotta components, so the orange ones that you can see here. But all the large gravel is that heat expanded slate or shale. Using heat to expand it makes it more porous, lighter weight, and able to hold a little bit of water. The rest of the media is going to be made up of other lightweight materials and some organic matter. A huge variety of plants can be grown on green roofs. Many are sedum green roofs. These are small, succulent plants that are ground covers. So they do very well with very little water and very little nutrients and don't usually require very much growing medium. Alliums are another low maintenance plant and more frequently now, different prairie ecosystems are being constructed on green roofs. These may require a little bit more growing media, so deeper substrate, but still don't require very much maintenance in terms of fertilizers or water. There are several different types of green roofs. Sedum mats, like this one here, are a little bit like sod that you would put down in your lawn. There's little to no growing media, and you can roll up these squares to transport them and put them onto the roof. So installation is relatively easy. There are trays like these that vary in size and depth. They're also relatively easy to install because you can put single trays up on the roof. You can pre-grow them so that the trays get installed when they already have good plant cover or install them and plant them later. One benefit to the trays is that if there's a problem with the underlying roof, you can just move the trays, fix the roof, and put the trays back. You can't really do that with a continuous roof, like this one. That's installed in layers. So the whole drainage layer, the filter fabric would cover the whole roof, then the growing media and the plants. So fixing a problem in the underlying roof structure may be a little bit more challenging because you have to pull up those layers. You also can't pre-plant a continuous roof. So it may take a little bit longer for the plant community to establish itself. Extensive green roofs are shallower roofs with less than six inches of media. These often support sedums, grasses, and other alpine species. So species that might grow at the tops of mountains, um, some other ecosystems like seaside cliffs and similar 
environments are being looked at for more species that can be grown on these roofs. These generally don't have public access and have little to no maintenance requirements. Intensive green roofs have more than six inches of media. And when I say more, it might be eight inches, it could be 20 inches. How much is gonna depend on how strong the underlying building is and your budget. The deeper the media, the more it's going to cost. But the more different types of plants you can support, including trees. These are often more park-like and may be open to the public. This one is one example that actually has a path going up the side of the roof there that people can walk on. This one down here is Millennium Park in Chicago. It's at ground level, but it is a roof because there's a parking garage under there. As I said, these are often more expensive than the extensive roofs, and they do require more maintenance. These modern green roofs have a history of development that I'm going to go through, but the idea of a green roof isn't new. The hanging gardens of Babylon are believed to be rooftop gardens. Um, and in 79 AD, when Pompeii erupted, many mosaics and buildings were preserved with rooftop gardens and terraces. Machu Picchu is another ancient construction that mimics the construction of modern green roofs. Or I probably should say, modern green roofs mimic the construction of Machu Picchu. When it was excavated to look at how it was constructed, it was found that underneath the plants and the soil was a gravel underlayer to promote drainage, much like the drainage layers used on modern green roofs. Sod roofs are another form of green roof that have a long history, um, both in Norwegian and Scandinavian countries, but also in the American West. Many American settlers on the Great Plains built houses into the hillside with a sod roof because they didn't have a lot of timber and it created good insulation. The earliest of the modern green roofs were actually produced by accident in Germany. In the late, or the 1880s to the 1930s, highly flammable tar was used on roofs during the building boom. One roofer decided to reduce the flammability of this tar, so it would catch on fire very easily, but when he covered it with sand and gravel, it didn't. Seeds started to gather in that sand and gravel, and that resulted in natural meadows. Several of these roofs were still intact in 2010, and some of them are almost 100 years old or older with very few leaks. In some cases, they even contain plants that are no longer present in the surrounding areas because they, those plants colonized the roof early on, and as the city grew up around the buildings, the other plants were destroyed. So green roofs, modern green roofs, and ancient green roofs have a huge variety of benefits that have been researched by scientists for a number of years. Here's a list of those benefits, and I'm gonna go through them and show you some examples. Um, stormwater management, energy conservation, mitigation of the urban heat island, which I'll also explain, increased biodiversity and habitat for animals, insects, and spiders, aesthetic value, so we enjoy looking at plants, that's always good, uh, reducing air and noise pollution, and increasing the lifespan of their roofing membrane. Green roofs, because of that soil and the plant communities, retain stormwater. So when it rains, less of the water that lands on the roof runs off the roof in a short period of time. Often that runoff is slowed the deeper the substrate you have. This can have many positive benefits to a city, reducing flooding, erosion, and something called combined sewer overflows, which is when the stormwater system and the sewer system are combined and when it rains, the amount of water in those pipes is too much for a water treatment plant to handle. So they have to just let the water go into a river or stream without treating it. These are a major problem in many large cities like New York. 
when we look at different types of green roofs, we can see that their average runoff retention or the amount of rain they hold in the roof differs slightly. So prevegetated mats, those sedum mats, are about 40%. Extensive and intensive roofs are 50 and almost 60% on average. Some of this depends on the amount of rain in the storm and how recently it rained last. This graph shows a comparison of the amount of rain, which are the blue bars, a control or traditional roof, the gray bars, and two green roofs of different depths, which are the green bars. You can see this retention. The amount of rain and the amount of water coming off the conventional roof or the gray bar are very similar. But the green bars, that line in the middle, which is the median, is lower. Green roofs can also improve stormwater runoff quality. So this means that they retain some of the things that end up in that rainwater when they land on a rooftop. They can take up and degrade pollutants, things that might have settled onto the roof over time out of the air. And in some cases, they can absorb nutrients as well. Now there's some disagreement as to whether they are a source or a sink for nutrients. A source would be a place that releases nutrients and a sink is one that takes them up. These graphs show some data looking at two different green roofs. The BKG roof is one that produces food. The regular, the one labeled green roof is a sedum green roof. Then we have our non-vegetative roof and the rain. We can see that for some of the nutrients, the vegetative green roofs are a little bit higher than the non-vegetative roof, but the agricultural roof is even higher than the ornamental one. We can see this one, the agricultural roof is higher. In this example, both green roofs are higher than the non-vegetative roof, but the agricultural roof is higher than the ornamental one. This is because they have different management practices. The agricultural roof gets fertilizer to help produce the food. The ornamental roof doesn't. The agricultural roof also has irrigation, which can play a role. But looking at a different nutrient, a different form of nitrogen, the agricultural roof is actually less than the ornamental roof. So it's a really complex situation and a lot of research has gone into determining what factors play a role in how much, whether, whether a green roof takes up nutrients or releases them. So I mentioned storm size, but intensity is also an issue. How much rain falls in a period of time? How much pollution or other particles have settled on the roof? since the last rain. The construction of the roof itself and the drain pipes. If there's something present in those drain pipes, it will be present in the runoff, regardless of what's going on on the green roof. How old the green roof is. What type of vegetation is up there. How much nutrients they need and how they use water play a role. The green roof substrate itself. What it's made up of how much of those different components are there, its depth and its moisture content, so how much water is already in that at the beginning of the rain. And then I mentioned different maintenance practices, fertilizer use, but also what kind of fertilizer. Not all fertilizers contribute the same way to the runoff. Energy conservation. Green roofs can help prevent energy from being absorbed by the underlying building. That also depends on the plant community present and the health of that plant community. I really like looking at these pictures because they really tell the, the story very well. In, on this side, the roof has not been very well maintained. You can see a lot of 
That tan color is the underlying media. Here, they've helped to rehabilitate the plant community. So it's completely covered now. In these pictures down here, the redder the area is, the warmer it is in temperature. Blues are cooler. So you can see that when the bare media is present, the temperature is quite warm. But once that plant community fills in the area, those temperatures drop a lot. A conventional roof can be as warm as 160 degrees Fahrenheit. On a regular rooftop, as the roof warms up, some of that heat is transferred to the building below. On a green roof, less of that heat is absorbed by the roof itself because there are plants absorbing some of it and they're transpiring, which helps to cool the surface. There are a variety of other roofs that are designed to do this as well. These are called white and reflective roofs. These can be very effective, but they have some drawbacks. This is a comparison of two types of green roofs and reflective roofs. In terms of installation cost, reflective roofs are much less expensive, but their maintenance costs are much higher. They need to be cleaned regularly so that those particles that fall out of the air and settle on surfaces don't reduce the reflectivity. They also don't cool using evapotranspiration like the green roofs will because there are no plants. They can, however, provide the same sorts of energy savings to the roof, the building below the roof. So I mentioned that some of the energy that's absorbed by the roof that causes it to heat up is transferred to the building below. When you have a tall building, that heat transfer only goes to some of the floors below. And that means that the cooling effect provided by the green roof, or maybe I should say the prevention of heating up provided by the green roof, only affects some of the top floors. So your building design will play a role as well. There are, however, green walls and other structures you could use to put on the sides of the building. Green roofs can also be used alongside solar panels. Green roofs, because they cool the surface of the roof, often help to keep the roof at a temperature that's best for optimal performance of the solar panels. So when solar panels get too warm, they don't function as well. With the green roof below the solar panels, they don't tend to get that warm. The green roof also provides shade, which creates little different environments on the green roof that may be preferred by different plants, different insects. This cooling doesn't just affect the roof and the building. It can also affect the whole city. An urban heat island is when the temperatures in the city are higher than the temperatures in the surrounding countryside. This can also include differences in the amount of moisture in the air as well. The urban heat island forms because of a number of different things we have done in the city that aren't present in the surrounding countryside. We have a lot of buildings. Many of these buildings are made of metal and glass that either reflect light or absorb it and warm up. Think about walking out onto a parking lot on a hot summer day. When you step onto that parking lot, you can feel the heat coming off the surface. But if you're on a grass lawn, you don't, it doesn't feel the same. That's going on in the city on all of our surfaces, the roads, the sidewalks, the buildings, the rooftops. We also run air conditioners to help keep our buildings cool, but those air conditioners generate heat as well. There's heat from the traffic, all the cars driving around. Um, and vegetation can sometimes help to reduce that heat. When we think of a forest and a city, here I have my city. These are my gray buildings. 
Those arrows are the light reflecting around between the buildings and sometimes being absorbed by the surface. During the day, that energy will be absorbed and during the night, it will be released, which is why even on the summer night, when you walk out onto a parking lot, it still feels very warm. In a forest, most of that energy is absorbed by the leaves. You also have evapotranspiration happening, which doesn't happen from the tops of buildings, at least not very much. An urban heat island can have a variety of different impacts on the city. It can increase strain on the urban energy grid. So we run our air conditioners to stay cool, but that also contributes to the heat. So the warmer it is in the city, the more we have to run our air conditioners and the more heat we generate. There are environmental issues. Um, ozone, which can be present in the air, is usually higher when there's an urban heat island. It changes wind patterns and groundwater temperatures, which can be harmful for insect, plant, and aquatic life. It can also have impacts on human health. We don't like to be in really hot environments for very long. And this affects communities without very many parks and street trees more than it does those that have parks and tre street trees. So shading more of our surfaces with trees and plants increases that evaporative cooling, reduces energy use for cooling, and reduces air temperatures in general. It makes it a much more comfortable environment to be in. This can have a bigger impact on the city as a whole by taking those air movement and ozone and all those things that I mentioned and making them more similar to the surrounding countryside than they were before the plants were there. Green roofs help increase biodiversity and habitat. So by adding plants, we're increasing biodiversity in our city. These plants are also home to a variety of different insects and animals, including the ones you can see here. Bees, wasps, butterflies, praying mantises, um, a huge number of different birds. Sometimes they're even used to host domestic animals like chickens or, in the case of the middle photo, goats, which get up there temporarily. Um, the, having the insects there means that there's also things that prey on the insects, like spiders. Green roofs can also be really pleasant to look at. Everybody likes to go to the park, walk around in the woods, and seeing green things has a positive influence on people, both in our mental attitudes and our ability to get well when we're sick, our ability to be productive at school or in our jobs. Regardless of whether these plant communities are more native or more park-like, that can create different aesthetics and different ways of looking at things and different types of beauty in the city. Putting plants in also has an interesting benefit of reducing air and noise pollution. So plants absorb carbon dioxide through their leaves. They don't just absorb carbon dioxide, they absorb everything that's in the air. What they need is the carbon dioxide though. As plants take up the air, they take up everything that's in the air, and this can include compounds that can cause problems in the urban environment. This graph shows some of them. O3 is ozone. NO2 is nitrogen dioxide. SO2, sulfur dioxide. These two can help contribute to acid rain. You can see that during the summer months, more is being taken up when the plants are active. PM10 are particles in the air. Those can also be taken up by the plants when they take in air. The number indicates the size of the particle. Plants require carbon dioxide to survive. That's what they take up. It helps them 
It's used in photosynthesis, and that makes the sugars that help plants grow and live. Carbon sequestration is what's going on during this process as the plants pull in carbon dioxide and store it in their tissues. Carbon sequestration can also be done in soils. And it's an important part of the carbon cycle. So as plants take up carbon dioxide and store it, carbon dioxide is also being released in other places in the environment. Some of it natural, like breathing animals, and some of it through human actions, like fossil fuel consumption. So when we drive our cars and we produce energy, we release carbon dioxide into the environment. There's some concern about how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere right now. So increasing the amount of carbon taken out of the atmosphere by plants could be a really good thing. Adding plants to rooftops is one way of creating extra plants that can do this for us. It doesn't even require very large areas to see a difference. So this study compared the amount of carbon dioxide in the air over this patch of plants and this patch of roof. In the graph, the patch of plants are the dark diamonds and the patch of roof are the pink squares. You can see that while the sun is out and the plants are photosynthesizing and taking in that carbon dioxide, the concentrations are lower. So these little patches can take up a little bit of carbon dioxide every day. And when we combine that with the energy savings that you might have from your building, because you don't have to cool it quite so much, the amount of energy that's put into creating the green roof, remember that I said that green roof media has heat expanded slate and shale, so there's energy that's used to do that that releases carbon dioxide. In nine years, the roof can take back all the carbon dioxide that was released in its production. When we look at a larger scale, not just one roof, but what if we had lots of roofs? If we look at metropolitan Detroit, so this is some information that one of my colleagues looked at, there are almost 60 square miles of rooftop in that city alone. If all of that rooftop were green roofs and sequestering carbon, then that would be almost 61 tons of carbon taken out of the atmosphere every year. Now, if you're like me, you don't really know what 61 tons of carbon, how much is that? But that's the equivalent of taking 10,000 SUVs or trucks off the road a, for a year. It's a lot. What kinds of plants you have on the roof also matters. So we did a study where we looked at different types of plants. Some of them are shrubs, some of them are flowering plants, and some of them are the succulents that are typically planted on green roofs. These plants are the plants that have more woody material and grow bigger and they took more carbon out of the atmosphere and stored it than the smaller plants. And that's something that we expected. Bigger plants that have grown more have more carbon in them than the smaller plants do. This group of plants, so herbaceous perennials and grasses, that was a mix of things like you might plant around your house in a flower garden. They sequestered or took up the most carbon on our green roofs. And that was similar to the amount of carbon that was taken up in the ground level plant community that's the same. And that tells us that it doesn't matter if these plants are on a rooftop using this special media or in the soil, they can do the same amount of sequestering. The succulent rock garden, so the succulents like I showed you earlier, 
also did a similar amount of carbon sequestration on the green roof than it did in the ground, which also tells us it doesn't matter if it's on a green roof or in the ground. I also mentioned the roofing membrane lifespan. So in a regular roof, you have some layers on there that help keep the water out of your building. There's a waterproofing layer, um, at least one of those, on top of whatever surface you have. On most conventional roofs, that's either covered with shingles, some kind of tar, or what's called ballast, which looks like gravel. Some light can get through that to the underlying waterproofing part. And that light can actually be damaging. Think about any time that you've left a garden hose out for a long period of time or a paddling pool. After a while, it starts to look old. Some of that is from the light itself, degrading the material. So putting plants on top of that waterproofing membrane means that the light no longer gets there. This graph shows how much light is coming from the sun at the top of a canopy of plants and how much light reaches the bottom of the canopy of the plants. So it's a lot less light across the part of the spectrum that we can see. There's also less heat fluctuation. So I mentioned earlier on that a normal rooftop can get as hot as 160 degrees Fahrenheit in the summertime. All of that increasing temperature and decreasing temperature and increasing temperature and decreasing temperature stresses the material. And it can start to crack and become brittle. When you put plants on there and some of that incoming light doesn't reach the bottom, not only are you protecting it from the light itself, but the reduced changes in temperature also protect the surface. Green roof waterproofing membranes have a life expectancy almost three times longer than a conventional roof. However, we don't really know what the maximum lifespan is. Remember that I said that there were some roofs that were 100 years old and were still waterproof? We haven't reached their maximum life expectancy yet. So we're not really sure exactly how much longer it will last. So green roofs can have a lot of really good benefits. But there are a few drawbacks. One is the cost. They cost a lot more than conventional roofs. Um, about $32 per meter squared or $3 per square foot more for the structure of the building to hold the extra weight. If you're retrofitting, you might also have to pay to remove the old roof. So you have to haul away the gravel ballast or the shingles or whatever was on there before. And that extra weight requirement can be problematic. So the little succulent plants that I mentioned, the sedums, aren't very big and aren't very heavy. Bigger plants are going to be heavier and require more media, and they will be heavier. So not only will the plants be heavier, but the media that they need will be heavier. Most buildings can only hold about 30 pounds per foot, and four inches of media requires about 22 pounds per foot. So most roofs, if we turn them into green roofs, could only be those shallow, extensive roofs. Now that doesn't mean that they still wouldn't provide benefit, but they might not provide as much benefit as the deeper roofs. So despite the challenges, there are lots of really exciting green roofs all around the world. I've already showed you the Millennium Park in Chicago, their city hall also has a really great green roof, um, some of which is devoted to growing food. There are a number of roofs that have that prairie look to them. Some are very new and some are a lot older. So the decoy bunker, um, that sort of stems from a story 
that in World War I and World War II, they would sometimes use sod roofs to cover up airplane hangars to hide them. And here are some examples of sedum roofs that are both very big and some very, very small. I've also seen a doghouse with a green roof. Um, and this little birdhouse, that's from a place called Longwood Gardens, which is in Pennsylvania. It's a big botanical garden, um, and that's near their prairie. So they're really exciting, and there's lots of potential uses for them and lots of room to learn more about how we can use them to make our cities better and our world better. I hope you enjoyed my talk. If you have any questions about green roofs or urban agriculture, I can be reached at lee.whittinghill at kysu.edu.